I think that where they're going to really hit a roadblock is unless Travis Kelsey has a true depth and appreciation for darkness, the arts maybe? that we don't know about. And, yeah, and maybe even honestly his own inner demons and darkness. I just personally think that there will be an entire part of Taylor Swift, potentially the most important part of her, that he will have very little access to and ability to relate to. Lauren, he does have an appreciation for the arts. He just signed to do 22 episodes of Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader for Amazon. That's a hit television show. Well, well, well. Oh, the three faces I'm staring at, sorry, the two faces, I'm, I'm including my own. These are, Chandler, what would I call us? Tortured listeners? Tortured Torch poets? Souls? Fans? Oh. Taylor Swift devotees, we are joined today. We are so lucky because this is truly such a major deal. The one and only Joe Peacock has joined the show to break down all of the tortured poets department. Thank you for having me. Uh, I need to talk to someone this Sunday morning, and I'm so grateful to be sitting across from the two of you. Joe, our listeners are about to be delighted with your talents, but I will say you're one of the only people, usually if we have a friend come on the show, people are like, quit it with the high school friends. No one cares what they have to say. <laughs> but when Joe came on the pod, they're like, uh, can we get Joe to replace Lauren? He is so funny. He is so good. So anyway, I'm so excited that you're here. I don't have any connection to that kind of like a faction of your fandom. So it, that's, that's all kind of like ingrown <laughs> themselves. Yeah, it's natural. <laughs> So where do we even begin with this great seminal tome of work by one Taylor Swift, the Tortured Poets Department? Chandler, I want to begin with my own journey here because I will say it was a fraught <laughs> journey. The universe, God, whoever had a plan for me because my journey actually began, uh, you know, not at midnight on the night of the album release. My, my journey began at 3 a.m. that night when I began to have food poisoning. Um, oh. And I, I had gone to bed after going to the Taylor Swift bar, going to Taze, um, and I was ready to wake up and really, you know, bask in the album when at 3 a.m. I was awoken by a rumbling and a tumbling, and I mm. proceeded to be sick for like the first eight hours of the day. So I didn't even get to listen to this album, and I, and I was getting, you know, an onslaught of text messages from my you know, multiple Taylor Swift group texts, and I couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't even listen to the album. I was so sick, and I just don't know why God sent this, this journey you know, for me, why that was my fate with it. But I, yeah, anyway, I just had to, I had to get that off my chest. Honestly, I feel like food poisoning would have been better than my first eight hours with this album. And Joe wow. was here for all of I it. I was nervous to come to this pod. I'm curious about your journey, Lauren, because I know where you were. And I feel like I've come to this uh, podcast with my Bible in hand, the lyric book, just ready to defend my faith. But <laughs> yeah. Ready to spread the good word. Well, Here's the thing. I came to this album hearing the leaks. Okay. So I did indulge in the leaked version of the album. And because this is really some unique sonic tapestries from Taylor, you know, we got some music that I think that on further reflection and closer inspection, she is self-aware about and completing certain projects. But at first blush and first glance, they they hit like AI to me, to be totally honest. Um, and and so anyway, yeah, I really wrestled with the, this music at the beginning. And I think that a lot of people are having and did have that reaction because this is not 1989 2.0. It's not a bunch of dance bangers. This is a sonic project by a true genius. You feel that way about all 31 of the tracks? No, no, no. But I feel like there's enough on both of these albums, but especially the first volume, that when I was listening to it leaked, I was like, oh, there's no way they ate seven bars of chocolate. Now Charlie Pluth is the best artist ever. Like, this is a joke. Like, this is an AI version of these tracks. An AI company is going to come out tomorrow and be like, we actually <laughs> were the ones that created the leak. This is the big marketing thing for our album. And it's going to be like Osama bin Laden claiming, you know, 9-11. Um, <laughs> and anyway... <laughs> <laughs> that, that was my hope and prayer. And I texted my other friend who was listening to this, Marin, and we were just on bended knee that we'd be getting different music at midnight. And so when I hit push play on Fortnite at 12.01, yeah, it was dark, but I don't want you to turn off this, turn I off mean, this episode because truly I come here today with a contrite heart and spirit. Okay. 
good. A mighty change of heart, if you will, because I have sat with this music and I do have a very different opinion than I did during those panicked first 24 hours. A mighty change of heart has brought me here today. I'm relieved to hear that. And no, I, I really thought you're saying, Lauren, this kind of reminds me when she dropped Folklore. And I remember even listening to Cardigan and thinking, the song is trash. And now I can't picture my life without it. <laughs> but like the songs and songscapes were so much more subtler and quieter than Reputation in 1989 that I dismissed them at first. But this album has grown on me mm -hmm. too. I agree with you that there's enough here for an album. I do have um, some beef with it though. And then that is, you know, she, she gave mm -hmm. us 31 tracks. I think there are 14 standout tracks. 14 standout tracks. Mm -hmm. That's a great hit rate for any album. Most albums do not have that many. Mm -hmm. The problem mm -hmm. is if you do the math, that means there's 17 skips. So that means she released an album with 17 mm -hmm. skips. And to me, it's like, I already have a job. It's not, it shouldn't be my job to edit this album. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I don't know. Like, I am thrilled with the, my version of the album I have now. Like, I, like, I, I, I truly have re really enjoyed the tracks that I like. But yeah, that is such a good point because really, if you can just pull out your picks and mm -hmm. you know delete your skips, I think everyone can arrive at a delicious Taylor Swift album. I completely agree. I think there are Taylor Swift albums that cut you open a million different ways. All right, mm -hmm. and you know every song is another high high or another low low. And I, I also compare this to like a folklore evermore, even honestly, where it's like we got some um, like honestly evermore more for me. Don't kill me, you know, for making that comparison. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, her power and on some of the tracks in it delivers and delivers. And then there's a lot of songs that are just in the middle. And for mm -hmm. me, this is just another version of that. But instead, it's, you know, 31 tracks and mm -hmm. there's just a lot of songs that fall more in the middle they're not bad i don't think she writes any bad songs they're just mm -hmm. they just don't slap as much and so yeah like with evermore i mean i think there's like for me there are five hits on that and there's 17 mm -hmm. songs yeah um but i don't consider it to be a, a bad album it just it maybe isn't enough you know midnights to me i have two things to say to that first it's that I think that with this album, there were songs that almost seemed laughable upon first listen. And Evermore doesn't have that for me. Evermore doesn't have songs like, I know you love Nobody, it. Nobody, no crime. Okay. <laughs> I'm well, sorry. I'm sorry. That's a, I don't think I've ever listened to that song the entire way through. Evermore <laughs> doesn't have down bad at the gym. Fuck it if I can't have him. No, it I don't have. That is a good that's song, a go Lauren. Okay, this is. I knew this was going to be a spicy episode and we're already getting into it. We're at seven minutes in. Lauren, I know that you think certain songs are laughable here, but I just completely disagree. No, no, and I think there I, are songs that are maybe more boring, but I wouldn't say any of them are laughable. I love like so High School. Them. I think there are laughable songs on here. I don't think I'm so. not saying that they're laughable songs. I'm saying that at first blush. Okay, if you're not willing to sit at the feet of Taylor and take these as certain projects, right, where she's saying, this romance sent me to a place of teenage angst. And so I want to express teenage angst. And that's the project of this song. If you don't come at it through that that lens and you think this is supposed to be Taylor Swift writing a great love song, then you're like, oh, Taylor Swift, angsty teenager, embarrassing. These lyrics are so, you know, so simple, so silly, you know, without any sort of complexity, so anti-literary for the torture Ugh. poets department and so i think that you know it gives a lot of fuel to the haters and we are charged with her defense mm -hmm. as has her disciples which we are and continue to be now i'm down bad crying at the gym everything comes out teenage petulance fuck it if i can't have him i like where you're going that lauren as far as like coming to with what our expectations were i think we all expected this album for us to find out why Ryan Reynolds and Blake Lively and everyone unfollowed Joe Alwyn. Yes. And it was to like really like look into mm -hmm. the dissolution of her relationship with Joe Alwyn. Whereas at least especially the first half, it's heavily about Maddie Healy, which is just a completely different kind of relationship. Yes. And so I think when we were listening to these tracks at first, we were like, wait, oh, these are like you say, maybe a little more like sophomoric or teenager angst. Um, but no less important. Like they they live in me now and I can appreciate them for what they are now. Exactly. I I yeah. thought we were going to be getting an album full of peace, peace, you know, plural. Like, that's what I thought. Like the song Peace, that's very complex, 
that's like hard to listen mm-hmm. to at times. It's beautiful. I thought we were going to be getting an album full of songs like like of that level complexity here mm-hmm. all about the six year long relationship she had mm-hmm. with Joe. I, I thought it would take me six years to process this album because mm-hmm. it was going to be so intense and, and like explain so much about their relationship that still sort of baffles me in certain ways. Um, and that's not what we got. So yeah, I do think there's, a, there's some expectation adjustment that had to happen here. Can I also say that I think that honest Swifties will agree that we came to this album hoping for that moment where the first words of the track start, the first notes, and it's just like your body is on fire. The song is so good and captivates you from beginning to end. This is not every Taylor song, but on her album, I would say two to three at least for me on all of her albums have this thing like anti-hero, like you're on your own kid, like maroon, where they really just hold you hostage completely. And I... I'm sorry. I'm just going to say it. I don't think we have any songs like that on this album. I respect your opinion. And I am so grateful that I have a song that does that for me on this album. Could I go off? Please. 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 Okay. The title track on this album, The Tortured Poets Department, does that for me. Really? From the very beginning, Mm -hmm. sounds like a John Hughes movie. It's like so hopeful. But the song, I know it started getting a lot of flack when the lyrics leaked. And because she has the infamous... um, you know, you ate seven bars of chocolate and we smoked and we declared Charlie Puth should be a bigger artist. <laughs> but I love that lyric. I love it. You smoked then ate seven bars of chocolate. We declare Charlie Puth should be a bigger artist. And I love this song. Yeah, this song to me is about how all of like you've got mail. When you fall in love, it's this collection of sweet nothings that somehow all add up to something. But yes. sometimes... All the little nothings don't add up to anything. Mm. And I think that's her like finding this out in those lyrics. But the, the song is also to me about how sometimes all those nothings can still haunt you yes. and remind you of everything you almost never had. Mm-hmm. At least that's what it does mm. for me. Oh, um, Joe, I completely agree. I love the title track here. I think the title track... I was not expecting it to cut me so deeply and it did. In fact, I remember I listened to the title track and then I listened to my boy only breaks his favorite toys and I preferred the title track to that. And I thought it was going to be the opposite. Um, And I, I mean the, the lyric of who's going to know me. I just, I I love the title track so much. And Lauren, I'm sorry that your elevator, your emotional elevator isn't going to the top of some of these songs. Cause I will say that, like, I will say, but daddy, I love him also is a full electrifying banger. Yes, Yes, I agree. But daddy, I love him in love of my life. I would say they really almost get there for me. They almost get there for sure. But going back to the title track and the matter at hand, I think that the problem is that I just come at this wanting greater poetry from the Tortured Poets Department. And when I hear lines like, at dinner, you take my ring... (laughs) So hard to read. At dinner, you take my ring off my middle finger and put it on the one people put wedding rings on. It's so clunky. It's so awkward. It's not good writing. At dinner, you take my ring off my middle finger and put it on the one people put wedding rings on. And that's the closest I'm sorry, but I wanted better writing. Totally. In the song's defense, I think that is, you're valid, that is the worst lyric of the song. I was reading the New York Times review of this album, and she said that she started counting the number of times Taylor mentions like wedding rings and fingers, Mm -hmm. and she ran out of fingers. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's, I mean, but then it's followed up with something even worse, and that's the closest I've come to my heart exploding. I mean, what is, is, it's giving Rupi Kapoor or whatever that, you know, Instagram (laughs) poet is named. Rupi Carr. It's just... It's I don't know. I don't I don't fault Taylor for her glitter gel pen like kind of adolescent lyrics because at the same mm-hmm. time she also like you know ham fists like extremely vocabulary laden songs with the with the album like I just I just she does both at times and she does I love paper rings you know and I love her more literary songs and it just is what it is I don't fault her I guess for having both. <laughs> I think the production on the title track, though, too, just like elevates everything. Yes, too. It, yes. T- it takes you somewhere else. I keep going back to it like every other song. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Can I just 
bring to your attention a few more lyrics, though, not because I think that they demonstrate the sophomoric level of the song at all. I think because they demonstrate why Maddie Healy hooked her so hard. Can I can get into that at all? Yeah, let's okay. get it, yeah. let's let's stop yeah. mincing the words of our dear Taylor Allison <laughs> Swift. And can we get into, you know, the greater matter listen, at hand? Listen, I'm just trying to I'm trying to share my opinions, okay, in the manner of Tamara Judge, but also say that I get what you guys are saying. I get this song is fun. It is fun. It is. It's fun to listen to, and I do enjoy it, okay? On on second, third, eighth listen, it does get better for me. Okay. This lyric, sometimes I wonder if you're going to screw this up with me, but you told Lucy you'd kill yourself if I ever leave. And I said to Jack, and I had said that to Jack about you, so I felt seen. Sometimes I wonder if you're going to screw this up with me, but you told Lucy you'd kill yourself if I ever leave. And I had said that to Jack about you, so I felt seen. I feel like Maddie Healy gave her this desperation of I love you, this love bombing, this obsession, this like we are two dark poets in turmoil. Only the two of us will understand each other. Only the two of us will know how to hold each other. And I think that, yes, this relationship might have only been three to six months, but I feel like when a man does that to you, it can hurt so much worse than a five-year relationship that Mm -hmm. never had the same depth to it. And that's where I come in Taylor's defense here and say it makes sense that she's in such turmoil over this, right? Like he's threatening suicide. Completely. I also want to add to that. I think, you know, there was like a long history even before where they were confirmed to be dating, where they were maybe in each other's lives, where maybe she had a crush on him from afar. And I think that the idea of him was also so strong in her mind. So then when they finally got together and he is love bombing her and he is turning out to be everything she hoped he would be to her, you know, mind, body, and soul, whatever. Like, I, I just think that's going to cut you even deeper than, than you know, your C-list actor who was really sweet to you when you were down and out. I agree. It's that long tail of expectation beforehand that just, like, made mm-hmm. it such a great height to fall from. Yeah, and I'm sorry. Like, I saw the GQ video of him talking about his typewriter. Like, the way I would let him, like, swoop me up for a summer. Oh, I would still balance. date him. After this album, I would still date him. Yeah, yeah same. I think I I think about to be married, no, but would still fine. date him. Everyone listening, finding Maddie Healy fuckable is a is an essential project when, you know, enjoying this album is at hand. And so I highly recommend watching that video. I agree. And getting into his music because I think Taylor had this unique perspective where he was also like a pop like he, she was a fangirl for him, right? Yeah. I mean, I just want to also say I I saw the 1975 when I was in high school. I took a picture with Maddie Healy cheek to cheek. I I have also had a long history with this man. Mm, and so this yeah. album also felt like closure for me, not even closure, but it, it felt like, you know, ripping up the the threads of my youth and, and my, my obsession with him. So anyway, <laughs> I just, I fully get it. I fully get it. Well, I watched him kiss a male, sec- two male security guards last summer. Um, oh, at his concert? Talk. Do you remember that? Yeah, he would just like kiss people. And yes. sometimes it was like a 50-year-old security guard. Sometimes it was like a 19-year-old security guard, both men. Yeah. Well, doesn't that explain the it was chaos it was revelry like Mm -hmm. uh, i think for taylor dating someone as uninhibited as Mm -hmm. maddie healy has got to be just so fucking fun right yes yes and oh after being with joe yeah right it was chaos he was revelry bedroom eyes like a remedy soon enough the elders had convened down at the city hall also, yes. clearly he, like, I mean, are we going to get in? Should we get into, I was wondering if we should go chronologically through the songs or should we just go straight to, but daddy, I love him. Yeah. What do you guys want to do? There's so much here. Like I'm down to popcorn style it. Okay. Let's popcorn style. Because I do think that that track really, it really <sighs> sums up the desp not even the desperate, but just the. The absolutely unbridled passion and love mm-hmm. that Taylor felt, the teenage love sickness, the floor it through the fences, just it's it's a dreamscape. I love uh, this song. Not to belabor my earlier point, but just like also when the boy that you have had a crush on forever finally likes you back enough to like date you publicly or to like to fully like shine his light on you, like you're just gonna be like, fuck everything else. I'm I'm literally a tunnel vision for you, like floor it through the fences. Mm-hmm. Totally. And this uh, through the fences, this song gives like speak now vibes in yes. such a strong way, which is so oh. fun. Um, but 
like I feel like the title could be replaced, but Tree, I love him. She talks about how the elders <laughs> assembled, you know, like I don't think it was really Scott that was stopping her. No. It was like Tree's like, this is making my job so much harder. Literally. I mean, I think I saw a, one of the reviewer comment on Reddit that was like, you know, what conversation with Tree was had before this song was put out on the album where it was like, look, I know yes. this is going to be a thing. Well, and this is, to be honest, this song was so good when I was listening to it at first, but I was like, really? Taylor is red-pilled? Like, for real? She's just going to, like, a lot of her fans fit the bill of Hannah's and Sarah's. And by the way, I feel terrible for anyone named Hannah and Sarah right now listening to this album, because that would put me in a dark place. Sure. But I just felt like, really, Taylor is going to ostracize or throw shade on a big part portion of her fandom. I was shocked. Another reason why I thought it was AI at first. Sarah's and Hannah's in the Sunday best Clutching their pearls, sighing what a mess I just learned these people try and save you Cause they hate you No, but I I love that about it I love that this was a literal fuck you To a serious portion of her fans And that we all love this song Like only she oh, could yeah. write a put a song on her album That's literally screw you, I don't care what you think And we would all like eat it up and love it well, I don't She's think never everyone's eating before. it up and loving it, by the way. Oh, I do really? think that some people really? are hating it? Uh, I think that people who are really anti-Maddie, the Sarah's and Hannah's she's talking about, are absolutely, like, I'm, extremely put off. Honestly, I'm happy to see them go. I am, too. Oh, bye-bye. Did she actually bye-bye. mention, like, Sarah's and Hannah's by name in the song? Yeah, she weird? says, um, wow. all the Sarah's and Hannah's clutching their pearls. Like, she fully yeah. drops yeah. that. I love when she says... Uh, sanctimoniously performing soliloquies I'll never see, which I just think are like Twitter rants yes, by fans. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So savage. Oh, it's such a burn. And I I think that it's so refreshing to hear yes. this from Taylor because I do think that yeah. Taylor, it's so easy to think that she's always trying to be such a good girl. And she's always like just trying to make people happy. She's the perpetual people pleaser, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. there's just something so gorgeous about her saying I literally fuck off to all of you guess right. what i'll tell you one thing about my good name it's mine alone it's disgrace i mean that's mm-hmm. full body chills. chills fbc i'll tell you something right now i'd rather burn my whole life down than listen to one more second of all this bitching and moaning i'll tell you something about my good I think like with a song like Antihero where she's very good at playing like people don't like me I'm the victim you know like this just felt like such an empowering like not it, 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 like there was no part of her that felt victimized by this it was just like screw all of you I don't care I'm going to continue living my life exactly the way I want to live it and it mm-hmm. yeah it felt so refreshing it was like jumping into like a pool in the middle of a summer day like I I loved seeing this like shade of her like so like blatant and fragrant fl- flagrant yeah <laughs> flagrant yes. yeah it's flagrant it's delicious um i do prefer this song to um who's afraid of little old me yeah. i feel like this song is that version of that but like subtle and like not over mm-hmm. the top like i only need one of them and this is it um oh yeah right yeah. right well it's interesting i feel like i felt like who's afraid of little old me well let me i mean is that written i thought it was written towards like the kardashians is it written towards fans Who as well knows? it's i don't know it's enemies I think our friend Caitlin posited that it might be written towards Olivia Rodrigo yeah. or someone did. I don't mm. know. It's just it's such a mess yeah. song for me. I mean, I I I wrote the I rated this one like a three. Well, and I think that yeah. Taylor on this album, she gets into certain projects, right? Or she decides I want to write a song, or she feels compelled to write a song about things that are deeply unrelatable, like mm-hmm. being so feared by everyone around you that you will, you know, go after them with a lawsuit, and everyone is just, you know, you're too big of a presence to, for people to want to hang out with you. I think also that happens on Clara Bow. I don't know how much a lot of us can relate to, like not being the iconic pop star of the moment perpetually, and that's like such a big fear of hers. Yeah, it seems to me like sometimes some of these songs, honestly, they don't expand to a place where they're going to receive larger resonance because they 
they go to bigger themes. They stay really specific and about Taylor. And I think that some of them, they won't be listened to and become like gospel for people the way yeah. other songs by other artists, you know, even about similar things will. And they do achieve that larger resonance. I feel that it won't like be the soundtrack to some moments of my life because like you say, I don't don't relate. But I do love getting the little sound bites into her head because they're like so self-referential. Mm -hmm. um, she's like in the great uh, last great American dynasty when she mentions like and the house that I bought. It's right. just like, oh, you, she it, like seeing her flex like that is, yeah. is kind of fun, I think. I, yeah. I will say I have a hard time with Taylor Swift like writing about history. I don't know if I'm just like not smart enough, but <laughs> I just like internalized misogyny for sure. No, no, it's it's not about like she doesn't have any right to write about history. It's just that I just don't care about history. I think enough um, mm, to like care fair. about like who the real Clara Bow was and why, why her life you know is a <laughs> metaphor for Olivia Rodrigo and Sabrina Carpenter or even like the last great American dynasty where I'm just like, oh, I don't really care about this woman from like the 1800s. <laughs> And I think that that's where, like, where she tries to be like this martyr from the past, like Joan of Arc, where I she loses me. Where I'm just like, skip. Let's go back to like right. so high school, and I want to, you know, getting like felt up in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> so high school is just like a throwback. I know they reference American Pie, but like, I love it. So I love much. it so much, and I know Lauren and I are gonna fully disagree about this because she texted, she spoiled it for me. Like uh, before I'd even listened to it, she texted me, and I'm gonna read what she said. I'm gonna pull up my receipts because oh she gosh. tried to literally shit on this song before I'd even listened to it. Okay, you haven't come around to it, Lauren. Well, I'll let Chandler. You know, so let me just. I'm just gonna. And, you know, she says, <laughs> put out her case. She goes, it's hard for me to talk about this album. I think it is so bad. <laughs> <laughs> and then she goes, so high school legitimately sounds like it was written by Ashley Simpton. Uh, sorry. S so Simpson. high school. So high school legitimately sounds like it was written by Ashley Simpson. <laughs> Ashley Simpson is great. She's great. Yeah, she's not Taylor fucking Swift. Oh my god, guys. Sorry. No. So okay, let's let's get into so high school if if we can. Let's get into So High School because I think So High School is another song where you have to approach it with the project in mind, okay? She's writing a song that's a 2000s, 90s nostalgic high school song. She's channeling Michelle Branch. She's channeling Avril Lavigne. It is bringing all the millennials back to the locker room and back to the lunch yard or whatever they call it. Are you calling it locker room talk? Are you calling so no, High School I'm locker not. room talk? <laughs> I'm not. I think that I appreciate it through that lens. For sure. But I think at the beginning when I'm listening to the album, sure. and I think it could potentially be fucking made by AI. I'm just like, this is a joke. This is a joke. Someone created to be like, see, these are Taylor Swift songs. You know, she's getting felt up while, while someone's playing video games. It just. <sighs> oh, I missed that lyric. Wow. Oh, she. I mean, she doesn't say getting felt up. There's I oh, okay. we're, <laughs> we're, uh, we're extrapolating there. <laughs> that would be that would be shocking. Um, I mean, here are some here are some reactions. So someone said, writes, this song is atrocious. Goddamn. From the shallow ass writing to her breathy, pitchy vocals. Easily my least favorite track. A lot of people were not fans of this song upon first blush. I'm not alone. I don't think you're alone. Well, you know what I have to say to that. What? My, easily my second favorite track. Yes, yes, agreed. I mean, she she rhymes Grand Theft Auto with Aristotle. You know how to ball. I know Aristotle. This song, just like, here's what I love this song. As a Chiefs Kingdom fan <laughs> and member, this song encapsulates Travis Kelsey to yes, a T. Yeah. It just, you, it captures like how happy and free he is and really how it must feel to ride with the top down, maybe top off with him <laughs> in a <the> car. <laughs> Top down, top off. Okay. I okay, pulled into the back seat. I mean, it is it is fun, but I will say that there are cringy moments. Like when she says, you know how to ball, I know Aristotle. Even that I is love just it. like kind of well, high school and embarrassing. Let me say. say let me no say. No one who actually I, knows Aristotle says I know Aristotle. I think that but line that's the is point a little, of the song. That line is a little pick me, but I let it slide. That line is is probably my least favorite line in the song. Like I I'm, I prefer the Grand Theft Auto line to that song, and I I think it's just because it's like 
I don't know. Something about knowing Aristotle just feels like a very annoying thing to say. Like, I don't want to yes. know any person who claims to know Aristotle. And Lauren exactly. was a philosophy major. So yeah, and I would never say that. I mean, anyway. I mean, no. And l- let me also- I want to be taken back yeah. to a high school love, though. And this song does that for yes. me by introducing me to a girl who's obsessed with the fact that she knows Aristotle right. and that she's getting felt up by a football player. I completely agree. I, I also just think it's so fun and it's just happy. And I, I saw a comment that was like, is this a anxiety free love song? for like the first mm-hmm. time ever. And that's what it is. Like, it feels so different for her. Um, it has like this nineties energy to it. Like it, it should be playing, you know, in the background of never been kissed or whatever. And I think coming off the heels of all these really dark songs about men who just like wrecked her, like upside down, you know, like over and over again, it just feels mm-hmm. like a summer day with your crush. Like, and yeah. I fucking love that. And I, that's why it's on repeat. And that's why I like, I was listening to it. I was riding a, a bike through central park yesterday. I just, it is so, it may just makes me feel alive and it might be, you might be childish and you might hate it, but I'm, I'm sorry. You don't get to experience it like that. I know. No, I know why you like this song. I mean, thank you. You painted a picture for us. I felt like I was there with you on that bike ride. It, and that is a gorgeous moment. It is a, it is a very sweet, beautiful love song in that way. But I will say, I think the real reason like that you like the song is because of the line, tell me about the first time you saw me. I feel like that's oh, something yeah. you ask Ben. Uh, like, daily. I mean, that's a that's in the Rolodex of just like, <laughs> I need some attention right now. <laughs> Can like, you tell me about the no, first time you saw me later. one day at 6 a.m.? <laughs> He's just like, got up for work. Guys, that is like Last so night. Chandler. Last night, I swear to God, we're waiting for takeout burritos before we go to a movie. And we're just like standing there. It's been like 10 minutes. We're waiting a little too long for my liking. And, you know, we both turn to each other to speak. And what I say is, when do you think we really fell in love? And what he <laughs> said, is, how much longer do you think we're going to be waiting for this? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> anyway, so that's that's very real. That's a, that's a real thing that happens. And yeah, I get it. I get it. She is me. I am her. I love her. It's the long suffering of Job for Ben. And for me, like I said in our group thread today, to get biblical again, I truly feel like for a lot of Swifties and for me, understanding this album, sitting with this album is like a Christian theologian wrestling with the God of the Old Testament. <laughs> it's like, why are certain things here? Why were certain things done? Why the plague? Why so high school? Why down bad? <laughs> and honest, <laughs> honestly, yes, we are painting a picture and we're figuring it out, right? We're figuring out God's purpose. We're figuring out the bigger plan. So okay, true. but you can't blame certain Swifties for being at first very put off by you know, women stoned or well, the alchemist, and- okay? Or the alchemy, Jesus Christ. I will say, I don't think it was God's purpose for So High School to be on this album. It does not belong to this album (laughs) tonally in any way. It should be a standalone single or the lead single of her next album. It should be Uh, in a private text thread with her, Travis, and a few friends, and it should be an inside joke song. I'm so so happy the song exists and that I can listen to it. I will say, to your point, somebody wrote this on Reddit, and I'm grappling with this comment, but somebody said that Travis is like her least interesting muse. And I do think that might be true. Joe, I, I can see those eyes. Have you oh seen gosh. his body? No, it's I, the most interesting but, body of anyone she's ever <laughs> dated. I don't maybe this is just the difference between a straight woman and a gay man. But to me, not to go there, not to bring this into it. Um, but a straight I, woman I, for Travis Kelsey? No, I'm just saying, like, I just no, he's he's super hot. It's just like that doesn't do it enough. For me, I, do you know what I'm saying? Like, I just think he's like compared I, I to some of her other. Chandler, what? I, can I? I think I know what you're getting at, which is Please, that he yeah. just. I don't think. Here's the thing. I think that where they're going to really hit a roadblock is unless Travis Kelsey has a true depth and appreciation for darkness, the arts maybe? that we don't know about, and yeah, and maybe even honestly his own inner demons and darkness. I just personally think that there will be an entire part of Taylor Swift, potentially the most important part of her, that he will have very little access to and ability to relate to. Lauren, he does have an appreciation for the arts. He just signed to do 22 episodes of Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader for Amazon. It's <laughs> a hit television show. My God. He's been interested in getting into producing for a long time. And I have to say, for ages, women, married women have gone to go to their book clubs. And guess who doesn't come with them? They're husbands. It's okay to have separate interests. It's a hundred. I don't see Kagan on this line. No, 
<laughs> no, I mean, I'm actually talking from personal uh, personal experience. I mean, Kagan says to me that he doesn't listen to lyrics and songs. Okay, when I try to explain certain things to him or I try to talk to him about music, he says, I don't listen to lyrics and songs. I mean, I think that the difference is, is Taylor Swift is Taylor Swift, right? She is... I. I am a pop apologist podcaster, okay? It's not, that part of me is not so important anymore, but Taylor Swift is like one of the great artists of our time. And if her interlocutor, the person who she is charged with looking across a table and speaking to for the rest of her life, doesn't have the depth to really contend with her ideas, there's going to be problems there. Well, that's what you get. I disagree. I think for. she gets a lot of that. Yeah, <laughs> Jack Antonoff in the studio. <laughs> um. Listen, we all we all make certain concessions in life, but I think it's I do think it's harder for billionaires and people who have like everything at their feet to honestly, I think, make those compromises. But Lauren, I think it's um, yes, it's hard to get everything you want out of a spouse, and. I think yes, she needs like intellectual and artistic uh, a par partner to create with. I feel like she can find that in a lot of people, but here's what's actually r really rare for her to find is someone to withstand the glare of public attention, someone to withstand her little oddities and <laughs> being kind of trapped in a 16 year old's mind sometimes and just being really dorky and extra. And that's exactly him. Like, yeah. I just, I think they're the same kind of nuts. Well, also, I will say, I think that he might, he might have the ability to be playful and to be. I don't want to say casual, but just like happy. He might have the ability, yeah. honestly, to be happy that she doesn't have access to. And yeah. that actually is kind of like, that actually is my husband in a certain way. Like, yeah, he doesn't listen to lyrics of songs, but he has a certain access to other things that he teaches me about. And so I think there might be something analogous there. Um, mm -hmm. I just need to, maybe I can do a double date and we can, you know, do the Venn diagram, <laughs> figure it out. Try to figure it out. I, I want to call out one thing before we leave. So high school, did she clear the line with him? You know how to ball I love Aristotle because I do think that would definitely call his contract with Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader into question because she's basically just calling him dumb in that line. That line is just like you don't actually know <laughs> shit about what's in textbooks. Um, and that really wor worried me. Like he just like you said, Joe, just signed a contract for 22 episodes. And I don't know if I were pr the producers, I would be kind of worried. OK, well, Chan, first of all, I think like his Twitter feed shows he probably doesn't really know Aristotle. <laughs> uh, he's kind of just squirrely. Like, yeah. Squirrely. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> um, But, you know, I think with spouses and with dating, like everyone is going to be spewing something. You're going to get caught in whatever like cloud, like whatever's raining from their cloud. Uh, mm. With Joe Allen, it seemed like a lot of sadness, bless his heart. With Maddie Healy, it seemed like some drugs and nefarious <laughs> stuff. Um, With Travis Kelsey, like I think the only thing spitting from his cloud is the spit coming from his little speeches at, you know, a, a victory speech. And honey, <laughs> like I'll get drenched in that all day, any day. No, I think I... Honestly, I am I am with you, ready to get soaked. I think Travis Kelsey I think Travis Kelsey is delicious. I think that he's super fun. I think that he is hot as fuck. I am excited for her because I think that sometimes like maybe the person or what you think is going to be best for you, like a Maddie Healy who can understand all your tortured poetry, mm -hmm. that's actually a miserable person to live right. with. That's a person who's so chaotic, who brings out the worst parts of you. She might need someone who brings out her lightness and her, you know, her so high school. Like that's going to be a more fun place for her to live than to live in the tortured poets department with Maddie Healy and his typewriter. Totally. No, and as much I, as you guys I, love you think that they'll get married. Ooh. Of I do. Lauren, do you think they'll get married and never get divorced? I my only fear with Travis is that he um he's kind of like us <laughs> with uh Kate Middleton, where it's like every day she wasn't found, you know, was like another huge day for the podcast. I almost feel like every day that he continues to keep dating Taylor, it's like a huge day for his career. And he knows that the second it's over, it's like mm. it's he's gonna be in a different place. And I just I don't want to seem jaded, but there's a part of me that's just is fearful that he could be using her. I just, I don't want to believe that, but it's just something that I, I fear. And so I don't know. I don't, it's hard for me to imagine them getting married and never divorced if I'm being completely honest. What do you think? Yeah. It, it's got to be hard for him to separate uh, how much I like, I love this person, but also like what it's doing for my career. And yeah. Success. yeah. It's got to be a hard thing to, how do you actually separate that? Also, isn't it interesting 
She wrote in Lavender Haze about how she just wanted to stay in the Lavender Haze. Everyone wanted this 1950s shit from her. And this album is like fixated on getting married. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I just found that to be very interesting given like how much actually getting married plays such a big role in her head. See, I actually think that in her earlier albums, I feel like she's always been not you know, I'm not saying this in a judgmental way, but I think she's always been fixated and excited about the prospect of getting married, having kids. You know, if you look at like paper rings and all of that stuff, I think that Lavender Haze was actually a moment of like delusion where it was just like, I don't even actually care about all that stuff. Yeah. I just want to like get back to the, the, you know, when, when our love was just like fresh and new. And, and I think, mm. and yeah, especially with like peace, she talks about like children and everything. And so I think this is just a return to really who she is. And, you know, she does want all those things. Yeah. It's actually kind of gut wrenching for me how many times she mentions children, getting married, rings, all of those things in this album, because clearly she's ready for that. You should talk to me under the table, talking rings and talking cradles. I wish I could unrecall how we almost had it all. And I don't know how much like the rings and, and marriage is more of like a narrative device of It's just easier to say that in a song to express that, hey, I want your everything and I want to be everything to you. And I want to just like be together until the end. But yeah, it does seem like Joe Allen couldn't give her that. And I'm curious what you think about their breakup. I I feel like we I work. I feel like we're kind of getting into the, the the gossip and I feel like we need to return to the music here. And I would love to do okay. that and exp- and explore that question through love of my life, because I feel like mm. the question of why they broke up. And if we read this track, a lot of people are really split on who this is about. But anyway, I do think it's one of the God tier tracks on this album with But Daddy, 100%. I Love Him. Those are my top two for sure. And my question is, is this a song about Joe or is this a song broken up about Maddie? I think it's about both. Joe, no question for me. Joe, no question. I think it's about both. I think the loss of her life is Joe, but I do think Maddie has references in here. There are references to Maddie. So I think she kind of pulls in some moments from Maddie, but I I think this, this song is mostly about Joe, but I think there are some like parts of it that feel so Maddie. It's hard to like ignore completely. And for what it's worth, I also, I don't want to live in a world where this song is fully about Maddie. So I'm trying to just like, you know, straddle the line. The reasons I think they're about Joe is like Mr. Steal Your Girl, because I think he stole Taylor from, was it Tom Hiddleston, I mm-hmm. want to say? Or Calvin Harris. At, at the or, time. I don't know. And then um, when she says, you cinephile, just because like he's famous, they're, they're famously really into movies. And I think he, quote unquote, taught her a lot about films. But it, this, the, my favorite lyric in this song is, um, our field of dreams in Gulf and Fire, obviously an ode to the 92 Kevin Costner classic, but it's also just like a wrenching metaphor. A field of dreams in golden fire Your arsons match your somber eyes And I'll still see it until I die You're the loss of my life Yeah, I mean, the lyric... Oh, what a valiant roar. What a bland goodbye. That also points to Joe because I do think that the goodbye with Maddie Healy wasn't bland. It was like quite cruel to just go someone you had been, you know, leading on very intensely. And I think that with Joe, it's kind of like the black dog. She says, you even forgot to stop sharing your location with me. It's like this relationship just fully petered out in the most bland way. Like they just gave it everything they could and then it just couldn't work and so anyway i i am being brought around to this being about joe which i really really hope for and for me if it's about joe and this is where we get into the weird parasocial nature of my relationship to taylor and this these songs anyway if it's about joe for me this is just like a god tier masterful song because it really expresses the sorrow of a good enough relationship but not a great mm-hmm. relationship not the love of your life, truly. What ends up being the loss. So I just want to say quickly, for my my point about maybe it having a, you know, a strand of Maddie in it is when she says, so in verse two, when she says, when your impressionist paintings of heaven turned out to be fakes and you took me to hell too, I think she's talking about Joe. 
And then she says, and all at once, the ink bleeds. A con man sells a fool, a get love quick scheme. But I felt a hole like this never before and ever since. I think that could be literally her just mm. referencing post Joe mm. Maddie. Because mm. mm-hmm. I don't think it was get. I, could see I, don't, that. I think Maddie was literally love bomby, get, get love quick scheme, con man. And all at once, the ink bleeds. A con man sells a fool, a get love quick scheme. But I felt a hole like this never before and ever since. Anyway, just just had to put that. And in I, it it might have happened like where um that song "Guilty as Sin" like it sounds like she's still in the relationship with Joe. Yes, but like she's maybe slowly getting yeah. bombed by Maddie Healy too. Right. Um. The, the also a lyric that struck me in uh, LOML is "You shit talk to me under the table." Oh, <sighs> that's Joe. That's, that's fucking Joe. Yeah, I'm just like, what did that look like? And that, yeah, that's I mean, just, that's awful. What is she has another line? I'm forgetting what it exactly is, but it's something about an esoteric joke or something. And I, I just yeah. think that's also Joe. It's just like you know, secretly he would make fun of her or he belittle her or and you know, she just could feel his like disapproval or not, you and know, not being good mm-hmm. enough and resentment. Yeah, like yeah. you're not a serious person. Mm-hmm. 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 I mean, it's just so. I really have the chills looking at these lyrics because for me, this song just goes to show like, this is such a serious artist and this is such a genius Mm -hmm. Taylor Swift. Like Mm -hmm. Taylor Swift is a master at her craft. And this song is, I think her at the height of her powers. It's heartbreaking. I have another lyric. I want to point out this just like incredible and your suit and tie in the nick of time. I mean, that's just full reputation era. You know, mm. like in the nick of time, just when I needed, you know, somebody to actually like me and for who who I was. Um, you low down boy, you stand up guy. You know, him being obviously super private. And you suit and tie in the nick of time. You low down boy, you stand up guy. You holy Ghost, you told me I. And obviously, oh, I don't think she would refer to Maddie as a stand-up guy. No, right? right. No, right. I agree. Right. Yeah. Also, like, it's just a classic Taylor Swift lyric of, I wish I could unrecall how we <sighs> almost had it all. Or just like, you're, you're talking about your expectations and how they just let you down. Mm-hmm. Well, what's your classic line about men will do nothing but let you down or something like that? Oh, oh men will uh, fail men- you every time. Quote from yes. That's something our, yes. our father told us at a casual dinner one time. We just like, know at a birthday out. dinner. It was at a birthday dinner. dinner. It was our little sister's birthday dinner where we were all going around sharing advice for her future. And my, our dad said <laughs> it was it was in the context of like make get sure job, you get, get a degree, get a degree and get a job because <laughs> men will fail you every time. <laughs> he's so good. He's so wise. I mean, he's, he's, he's never spoken true words. I mean, honestly, I hope dad and Taylor never talk because I don't know. She might she might kill herself after hearing the prophecy. OK, where she wonders if any of this will ever turn around. The prophecy also devastating. Thanks. And I think this, that, okay, song, this brings up. Ugh, it's just so this, sad. I want to say this. Courtney, our dear sister, texted this and she said that she feels like this album, it's so sad and it's so depressed and it really shows what a bad place Taylor is in. And it feels like the way heartbreak hits in such a more devastating, horrific way, truly, in your 30s than Mm -hmm. in your 20s. In your 20s, who knows what could happen? It's still, you know, life is in front of you unfolding every second. Who knows who you can meet? But in your 30s, I think that you start to see, instead of it feeling like the beginning of your story, you start to see like the book being written. And it starts, and I think it can feel like, it can feel like your story, you know, you stop having control of it. And can, I think it can be hard. It can be hard to keep hope on some level. And I, I don't want people to feel that way, but I think that is a reality. And I think that's really captured in the prophecy. These have been on my knees. Change the prophecy. Don't want money. Just someone who wants my company. Let it once be me. Who do I have to speak? about if they can redo the prophecy 
I was just going to say that literally took the words out of my mouth. I completely agree. I think you start to see the repeated themes over and over mm-hmm. again. And I think the prophecy is her like grappling with that and just like, can, can this not be true? Can this somehow work out for me? Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I'm going to need to revisit this one. The production on it just like was so sleepy to me. I think I, I skipped it after one listen. Well, sorry. Can I just say though it's all right. that? It's all right, Joe. I think that. Joe, I think that you're validating some of the criticism of this album, which is that a lot of the production sounds very similar and a lot of it can kind of blend. One song can blend, blend it to the next. And this can almost feel more like spoken poetry and less like songs. Yeah. Like a lot of these songs for me, they don't lead with the melodies or the music or the crazy bridges. Mm-hmm. They, It's more just like super depressed ramblings at time. And I think that almost speaks to the listlessness of depression, possibly, and speaks to truly yeah. the dark mental state she has been in. Oh, it's, a, it's really sad. And I, I also will agree with you, Joe, that it took me like my third listen of the whole album before I like read the lyrics of the prophecy. And I was like starting to think like, okay, this, this makes more sense. I understand what it's about. Now I can like grab onto it a little bit more. It was not something that instantly hooked me or caught me. So I'll put in the work. Thank you. Um, I would think we should talk about kind of speaking to this. I would love to go to I Can Do It With A Broken Heart. I really want to get your opinions on this song. Let's do it. I can do it with a broken heart. I'm so depressed I act like it's my birthday every day. I'm so obsessed with him but he avoids me like a play. I took that one out for a spin on a run yesterday and it's a bop. I don't think it reaches the heights it could. Like it should, I think, be like a masterful pop song, like Blank's Place or Wildest Dreams. But don't get me wrong. I love listening to it. And uh, honestly, I relate to it with like in a work setting. Like, mm-hmm. sure, I can fake it till I make it. I'm a, I love the lyrics of I'm a real tough kid. I can handle my shit. Smile, mm-hmm. bitch. Like, yeah, like I can do that. It mm-hmm. makes me want to do push past what I'm, I'm capable of. Um, but also, I don't know. It doesn't quite totally reach the heights I think it could. No, and I think that I completely agree with you. And I think that it's like a lot of songs on this album. Like to me, it's like down bad where it's fun to listen to with the lens of like, oh, this sing songy, overly formulaic, almost like synthetic sounding chorus is supposed to sound fake and hollow because she's, you know, mm. she's just right. Baking it. phoning it in. She's working working through it. Oh, I like that. Um, So, but I think that on first listen, especially you're like, what the fuck is this? And I- Yeah, clinkity clank. Yeah, like it was a cloud I had to get through to appreciate this album for sure. And anyway, I just, I do wish it had reached the heights of A Cruel Summer, of A Wildest Dream, of a crazy good (sighs) pop song that you really, you want to jam to. And I think this is a song that will come on and you probably won't turn off. I don't know it's a song that you'll reach for. Yeah. It's giving kids bops, but I love the lyrics and Mm -hmm. I like the message, but yeah. I like the message. So funny. It's like a movie your parents saw that they like didn't fully love, but we like the message. Um, (laughs) Well, my mom, she didn't like a movie that we were watching with her. She'd say, I really liked spending time with you. (laughs) (laughs) That's what she said after we watched Tyler Perry's Why Did I Get Married (laughs) 2. Oh my gosh. So funny. Okay. I have one thing I want to say about I Can Do It With A Broken Heart. What I did appreciate about this song, while it's not something, it's not necessarily a song I'm going to reach for, um, is I liked that it sort of answered a lot of questions we were all having, you know, while the Eras tour was going on and so much shit was happening in the background of her personal life. Her and Joe were breaking up and she was just getting out there and performing. And I think it just sort of validated that all of us, what all of us were worried about and thinking about was just like, how is she continuing to do these three hour shows night after night when all of this stuff is blowing up behind her? And I, Mm -hmm. so I guess I kind of liked her being like, yeah, I was, and I'm really good at this. And I, it it was a little cocky and I, I, yeah, I was, I was into it for those reasons. Have you seen that clip of her Florida show where after she plays lover, they hand her a guitar and the lights are kind of dimmed. They're like, especially like a a quick uh, resetting. Mm-hmm. And she's wiping tears from her eyes, Ugh. and it, it just like matches the vibe Wait, of the song. For like, real, okay, let's go. I need to yeah, watch I'll it. send it to you on on Twitter. Oh my yeah, gosh. yeah. I mean, it's, it I need to see that. I do also love the ending lyric of "Try to come for my job." 
<laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> it was so funny. I absolutely, I absolutely love it. The one thing that I do feel though is I think that I don't, there's just a part of me that's like people spend thousands of dollars. This is like their one annual experience that they're putting so much money to go see, mm -hmm. to experience. They work so hard for it. And there's just a part of me that's like, I don't know that this is the right moment to be letting people in on kind of faking it for them. Like, I just, like, I get that she's such a great artist. She, you know, performs in the rain. Um, she is incredible that way. But there's just a part of me that's like, it almost seems a little insensitive to the fan base to be like, oh, yeah. And I was, I, and I can, I, I disagree. Do you, do you, I don't think the fans yeah. are going to, would be upset about knowing that she was going through it. I think the fans love Taylor Swift for the messy storm that she is. You know, they don't love her necessarily. Like, and she, I don't think anyone was let down by her performance. I don't think anyone's like now looking back and being like, wow, I really wasted that money because she wasn't having a, a good time out there. Like <laughs> she could have also been having a good time, but also breaking down inside. And that's like, that's the Taylor we I know and love. People are disputing their American Express car, car charges. Joe knows all about that Florida Disney. show. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it makes you appreciate her more and, and her shows more um, because as we've been reminded by uh, Kim Kardashian, nobody wants to work anymore. I'm serious. You see that so many tours <laughs> are canceled. Like so many of these yes. artists, I'm, I won't name them on here, are like they're scaling back tours mm -hmm. or they cancel them because I'm exhausted or I can't go perform. Like, great. I respect mental health, but like, don't sign up with uh, Live Nation to create, you know, a 52 date tour. Like she, this right. woman follows her commitments. Yeah. So. No, it's it's true. It's true. Um, I want to get to the Kim Kardashian of it all. But yes. before we do that, can we talk about the, ta the opening track Fortnite? Because yes. I do feel like I want to speak to this and I want to talk about Florida. I want to for sure cover like these big moments in the music um, before we get to more of kind of the gossip. But I am curious, how did you guys feel about Fortnite when you first listened? I was supposed to be sent away, but they forgot to come and get me. I was a functioning alcoholic to nobody knew. I think it's so sleek. I really like the song and I keep going back to it. I have no idea what it's about. I assume it's fiction. <laughs> I don't even know what Fortnite means. Can you guys explain? Two weeks, right? Is it two two weeks? Oh, really? Yeah, it means two weeks. And it's it's kind of like, you know, Downton Abbey speak for two weeks. It's just an she archaic loves to do that. That's crazy because they they don't use night plural in that word so fortnite sounds like if a someone was like can i come stay at your house for a fortnight i'd be like sure that's like one to two nights i would not think two weeks. <laughs> no it's <laughs> watch it's out weeks. joe watch out someone might try yeah. to have you wow i i think it's a solid opener track i'm i'm not necessarily hitting it on repeat but i, I it's a solid opener track i like post malone in it yeah it's a vibe. i i was a functioning alcoholic till nobody noticed my new aesthetic like of course I thought this was AI. Has Taylor ever written lyrics that bizarre? Like, has she ever had a song that honestly, narratively, it's so, it lacks so much cohesion. You're really lost when you're listening to it. I don't know what it. that, do you know what that means? Does anybody know what that really means? Well, how about the lyric, thought of calling you, but you won't pick up. Another fortnight lost in America. Moved to Florida by the car you want. What? <laughs> I, okay, this makes me feel better that I was so confused. Yeah. I've famously um, been an advocate that Taylor Swift should be defunded as a director of music videos. Like, I find her music videos cringe, but she knocked this one out of the Right? Park. I, I agree. I love the music. And I, I agree with you. Like, her visual directing and style can be something I contend with. But this music video was so fun. If looks could kill, I was murdered watching it. She just was clearly... I don't know the way she embodied just someone who was driven fully insane. It was yes, so visually yeah. cool and fun to watch. I will 100% be rewatching. I'm with you. 
I she also, looks amazing in it too. She looks incredible. I also feel like Fortnite really is a perfect opening track because it's like, let's all enter together this vertiginous landscape of Taylor mm. Swift in this new, really this new musical landscape. Because I feel like with Fortnite, you don't get anything you think you're going to get with Taylor. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it's almost like on this album, expect the unexpected. Who knows what's going to yeah. come next? This is going to be a weird kaleidoscope. You might get dizzy. You don't even know where you are, but just enter the tortured post department. And I think that's a perfect segue for us to talk about what truly was unexpected in Florida, three exclamation points. <laughs> you can beat the heat if you beat the charges too. They said I was a cheat. I guess it must be true. And my friends all smell like weed or a little bit. A song I will hide on my Spotify. Well, hide! I'm gonna hide it as well, Joe. It, <laughs> I this is I've ne- I will never probably listen to this uh, from start to finish. I mean, I I loved Florence and the Machine, but this song makes me like hate her voice. I don't. I I feel bad saying yeah. that. I just. I don't like it. I I actively don't like the sound of this song. Well, I didn't like this song at all either until I learned what's behind it. Okay. Do you guys Is it about Scooter? I don't know. It's not about Scooter. She so she did like iHeartRadio, she introed a few of the songs. Um but so she says that this song is about she watches Dateline constantly. She literally says, I watch Dateline all the time. And it seems like everyone who's on the run tries to escape to Florida. So that's what this song's about. I'm Lester Holt, and this is Dateline. I'm always watching, like, Dateline. People, you know, have these crimes that they commit. Where do they immediately skip town and go to? That they go to Florida. You know, they, like, try to reinvent themselves, have a new identity, blend in. Like, it's literally, it's about... Oh, it's like a creative prompt. It's a creative prompt (laughs) about just, like, skipping town to Florida and just getting fucked up in Florida because you're so down on your luck, which I find to actually be delightful but as a project. do you sonically I actually, like it i actually really like this song i feel mm. like it's such a bop it's so fun to listen to it's super enjoyable for me enjoyable the new york times and my sister said it was one of their favorite tracks on the album wow yeah it's just it's a fun groove florida I do feel like it's a little rude on people who own timeshares and anyone who enjoys living in Destin, Florida. I mean, you We're work your life away. You, Jamie Lynn Spears. <laughs> <laughs> you work your life away just to pay for a timeshare down in Destin. It's just a little uh, pejorative to the good citizens of that town. She won't be touring there anytime soon. Little did you know your home's really only a town you're just a guest in. So you work your life away just to pay for a timeshare down in Destin, Florida. I don't know. As I've as I've mentioned online, I have a strict uh, I will not date you if you spend a significant amount of time in Florida. And significant <laughs> to me is more than three weeks. So. I think more than a fortnight. I mean, isn't there a part yeah. of you guys that just wants to know what it's like to like commit a heinous crime and like be in a fugue state and under like the burning sun of Florida doing drugs? I just Absolutely feel like... Absolutely not. M- mentally, no. I want to... I want to go through that experience. Florida. I, I, <laughs> I, oh, oh, I hate it. I hate it. I, yeah. I hate well, it. I love it. I love it. I don't so like gross. it. It's, it's like I can't skip it fast enough. It's just a fun alternative <laughs> reality to think about being strung out in Florida. I don't know. I just, uh, the other thing that sort of bothers me is like, okay, you have this session with Florence Welch. You have this time to like bang something out and like, this is what we get. This is just like, this is, this is where I go back to, yeah, this album really did need an editor. Well, I'm at, see, the thing, the difference between you and me, Chandler, is I'm at the acceptance stage of this album. Mm, I, I had, I had full there. anger. I had yeah. denial with the AI. I was very upset for a full day, but now I've accepted and I'm enjoying these songs on their own terms. Okay. And, okay. but I agree with you. I do think that it's, it is criminal and maybe Taylor should, you know, be forced to go to Florida for a while because you're Let's right. Like, like with Florence Welch, at the helm they could have created some pure magic like another cruel summer another bop that just just shakes you to your core Mm -hmm. but that's not what we got Mm -hmm. no that's not what we got Mm -mm. i want to bring up really quick yeah thank you amy so i know we we touched on the kim (laughs) song because this is another one where i just i don't actually understand it 
very well. Like I, I get that it's a diss song about Kim, but uh, I, I gave this one a zero. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It fe- it feels like mean from Taylor's first record, but like, it like lacks the like winkingness of it. Um, I think it's th- th- there's one thing about Taylor Swift is that the culture will move on, but she won't when it comes to like a grudge <laughs> or hating someone. But I also get where she's coming from uh-huh. because here's what's happened with Kim Kardashian is Skims has taken off, and now people in Taylor's inner circle, Brittany Mahomes, Lana Del Rey, are modeling for her, and Kim is going to be you know a television star on Hulu. So I think Taylor wants to be like, hey, hey. You may all think she's this evolved person anymore, yeah. but to me, she will always be this bitch. Right, right. So I read some interesting theories, um, and I I'm, I'm with you completely. Taylor doesn't let down. Taylor holds a grudge. Okay, she gets stuck in the past completely. Interesting. She buries hatchets, but she keeps maps of where they're buried. Oh yeah, and they're buried shallow to the earth, you know, so she can quickly <laughs> retrieve them. But I think that I think that with "Thank You, Amy" and this song, I read an interesting theory that. They say that basically there's no way this song's actually about Kim, given that she says, like, I scrambled the clues. No one will really know who this is about. Mm. And I just almost feel like Taylor is too smart to say that and not scramble the clues at all to make it so obvious. Like, it's one thing if there weren't the capital letters and it's just thank you, Amy, and you have to right, put together right. that there's Kim in there. Yeah. But to spell it out for people and then to say I've scrambled the clues, someone's like, this is about a high school bully. It's about a high school bully, some some bitch, you know, who lives in Pennsylvania or Nashville or wherever and has kids who come home seeing Taylor Swift and has serious beef with Taylor. And that, to me, was like a moment of vindication where it's like, maybe... Maybe there is something there. Okay. Any thoughts? I is this can't copium? Like, this is about Kim with the, the spray tanned uh, bronze statue. But I mean, I like that idea and going there was, was fun. But I, I love that she invoked Kim Kardashian's child in the song. <laughs> yeah. Wild. Someone was like, of course, she's bringing children into this discussion. Innocent children who had nothing to do with this fight. <laughs> I do. I do always wonder if people in the Kardashian circle have to hide being a Swifty or if they just fully, you know, blinders up, never listen. I mean, I think Kim Kardashian has had a video of her working out to Taylor Swift songs. Like she's just Kim apathetic, Kardashian, maybe? I think actually in comparison to Taylor present day, it seems so mature and like she's moved on. She does not engage with this at all. Well, what? here's the thing is Kim what? Kardashian was the murderer, so of course she's moved on. Taylor <laughs> Swift was the victim, and Kim was on Watch What Happens Live with Andy Cohen, and Andy Cohen's like, so what's the situation with you and Taylor? And she's like, yeah, we're good. And I'm sure Taylor saw that and was like, bitch, no, we're not. Thank you, Amy, was written the next day. Okay, for sure, but I guess, I, in my opinion, Kim comes across as more mature right now. And like she's not, and like she's excluding herself from the narrative. Yes, she was the murderer. But she's not throwing shade on Taylor. She's not responding. She's just, you know, taking another selfie in nude underwear in her big bathroom. I'll concede that Taylor does not sound mature in this song, for sure. And I think I think Kim's like, you're sad that I murdered and tried to ruin your little life? That was so long ago. Like, get over it. <laughs> also, well, can we discuss, can we just discuss the scene Imagine the scene where Taylor goes to Aaron Dessner and is like, I want to write a song about the this fucking drama with Kim Kardashian. Like, what is... <laughs> Aaron Dessner I, just puts his head in his hands. <laughs> he's just like, Aaron Dessner's like, sure, let me take off my skims first. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just, I don't know. It's so funny. I just wish Wait. Bon Iver also had been on this track, too. I to just make it even more... <laughs> it is wild, Lord. That, it's that's wild. When, that's when Aaron Dessner is just like, you know what? It's a check. A job is a job. And you just you show up yeah. every day and you just get the check. While we're on the subject of Aaron Dessner and, and the Dessner family, um, we were talking about this briefly before we recorded in our in our group chat. Wait, we can't move on yet. I have to stay on the song really quick. Okay. Okay. Before we move on, I know where you're going. Before we move on, I just think it's important as as people talking about this album to discuss really quickly and imagine 
first of all, Taylor screaming at the sky, fuck you, Amy. Okay. And also <laughs> Andrea, okay, Andrea Swift stomping around whatever home that they're at for that week and wishing Kim was dead. I think she did. I can fully picture I the latter. I can see it. I've seen her in, I think it was like the Miss Americana documentary where she's like, they're upset that someone forgot a flash drive at home. And Taylor's like, oh no, that was my fault. And Andrew's like, honey, you can't do everything. It was her fault. Like she would let her, someone have it. <laughs> She'd set yeah. her dogs off on him. <laughs> yes, for Dalmatian. <laughs> so, it's just, I'm sorry. It's absolutely hilarious. Um, but let us also not forget, it's not the first time someone has invoked um, the name Amy to actually mean something yes. else. Remember Britney Spears says yes. F-U-C-K me? Yes. If you see K me. I thought that was clever. Oh okay, Chandler, sorry. You may proceed with your original plan. Thank you. To, to take us away from this so, song. With the song Robin, it's hitting for some people in our circles. It is continuing to not hit for me. And when I did some more research on it, trying to understand how it could hit for me, I saw that it was potentially written about Aaron Destner's daughter named Robin. Don't mean to bring an innocent child into this, but like, I just, <laughs> I just don't need a song about Aaron Destner's kids. Like I can barely handle Blake Lively's kids being involved in some of like Taylor's works. I, I just, this is why this album needed an editor. I'm just, I'm good. I didn't need the song about Aaron Destner's daughter. I think that she went to a baby shower for Robin and she was like, I wrote a song for your child, right? And she played the song about the dinosaurs and it's very lovely. And then in that moment, she used that kind of emotional leverage to say, I would love for your collaboration on a song about Kim Kardashian. <laughs> and he couldn't say no. He, <laughs> he couldn't, couldn't say, no. say no. Literally. Joe, does this song hit for I you? actually does. I really? didn't think I needed a song about Aaron Dessner's child, but I actually do. I find it beautiful. <laughs> To be fair, I thought Robin was a boy. I don't know, but I, I, so I, it just like reminded me of my own innocence. I was on a walk this morning. I was like, oh, I love, I was just basking in it. Mm. Um, but also to be fair, when I first listened to this song, I just assumed it was going to be about Joe Alwyn. And I was like, oh, he must have had a favorite spot on the swing set. Oh. <laughs> and then it kind of got more stranger, like, oh, he had dragonflies on. I was like, okay, wait, this probably can't be that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Joe loved I, I, I dinosaurs. Love, I, I mean, uh, you loved it so much. Did it go on your version of the album? Is it on your short it list? Did. Wow. It, yeah, yeah. Oh. It's on my short list. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I just thought it was a lovely song. You know what song barely made it on my uh, version of the album? What? what? Is The Alchemy. So when I touch down, call the amateurs and cut them from the team. Ditch the clowns, get the crown, baby. I'm the one to be. Yes, I can't believe it made it. All I at think all. it's an offensive song because Thank presumably you. it's about Travis Kelsey. But I'm sorry, it is so generically about sports. It might as well be about Rob Gronowski. Like, get out of here. And you love you love the Chiefs. Like you as a football fan. I love fan, the Chiefs. It doesn't hit for but you. There's and no Chiefs. But there's nothing that captures the spirit of Kansas City or my boys in this song. I'm sorry. No. See, I'm just gonna. I'm gonna say i don't want a taylor swift song that talks about warming the benches i don't know i don't want straight football analogies i i Do have a target on my back the so fun in high school is the most football i want in any of her songs so long yeah. in high, or high make school? it like more specific talk oh, to me sorry. about andy reed and talk to me about you know pancheco running down the field like give like you're mm. right such specific lines. yeah right like give it to me like you know the chief's kingdom like i do like you should you've been in it bitch. right <laughs> So really, we don't want songs. We don't. We don't just want songs about football. We want songs about really specific plays, like almost. I don't care about touchdown as a concept. I care about my boys and what they did last season because I watched every game. She yeah. allegedly did, but maybe she's too drunk to remember. <laughs> You've been robbed of what could have been. Fans oh, I'm everywhere. waiting for the next album. Well, I'm glad we're at least together on not enjoying this song. I just think what I was saying is just, I think that the, you know, you know, ball, I know Aristotle, like that's the length to which I want the football, you know, sprinkled in the songs. That's as much as I'll take. I think that's fair. Um, I want to, I, I, yeah. I know we're, we're getting close to the end of our recording session. So there's two songs that I want to touch on, but maybe we only have time for one. 
What do you guys think? I definitely want to touch on the smallest man who ever lived. I think it's important. Yes. I think we need so maybe to. let's oh, just yeah. finish there. And Chandler, you and I can contend with So Long London on our bonus episode this week for subscribers yes. and Patreonies. Okay, great. You guys take it away. The smallest man who ever lived. And I don't miss what we had, but could someone give a message to the smallest man who ever lived? I think that this is one of the best tracks on this record. <gasps> Joe? It didn't make my yeah. It didn't make my, Joe's version of this album. Um, I it just it's not a bop, and it's uh, um, but um, that bridge. Yeah. you don't want to feel that bridge reverberating through your body one more time. Oh no, I'm remembering now. Yeah, I didn't like how all of a sudden the song turned Changed? sonically and was like, yeah. Did oh. you want me dead? Like it just didn't do <laughs> it for me. It. But I'm yeah. Um, I, I do I, like the line in fifty years will all this be de- declassified, but. Yeah, go off, girls. I loved it. it. This one is a 10 out of 10 for me. I think that, especially going into this album, thinking this song was going to be about Joe, and then knowing it's just a full Maddie diss track where it, it, she talks about how he asked a friend of her friend for drugs and that person ghosted him. I mean, it is scathing. And I love the way the music transitions. To me, it's like a song you want to scream sing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, 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 I love this one. Um, and I think that, I don't know how Maddie Healy's current girlfriend can listen to this in, in good conscious or good <laughs> conscience. A message to the smallest man who ever lived. Were you sent by someone who wanted me dead? Did you sleep with a gun underneath our bed? Were you writing a book? Were you a sleeper cell spy? In 50 years we'll all Get you, but I'll never forgive the smallest man who ever lived. It's so funny. It's it really goes to show love of my life is not about Maddie Healy because this is not a no. bland goodbye. This mm-hmm. is this is for her. I mean, she thinks he should belong in prison. Which, if we could imprison exes for their wrongdoings against us, that is a political platform. I could finally reengage with politics, okay? Absolutely. If, if Joe or Don could get that on their platform. Because I'm with Taylor. Like, I think, I don't know. I just, I love being transported to that feeling of being so utterly done wrong. It's just yes. so cathartic. It's like, uh, were you h- going to kill me? When she says, you said normal girls were boring, but you were gone by the morning, Ugh. Ugh. It's just like fuck this guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, the no, lyrics I had, are yeah. so juicy. I do think that it takes too long to get to the bridge. the mu- The music mm. is a little one note and kind of boring until we get to the bridge. And I think this song could approach God tier status if it was sonically more interesting and more captivating from the beginning. Thank you. It does have like incredibly juicy lyrics, but yeah, it's it's flat for me. But I love the in your Jehovah's Witness suit. Like, yes. I'm sorry, I don't think Taylor Swift has ever answered the door to Jehovah Witnesses. They're not getting <laughs> past her security. No. Do we want to just really briefly, given that this is the torch Maddie Healy on fire song, discuss or ground ourselves in the words of Aunt Debbie? Please. So obviously this album lights Maddie Healy on fire. And so his aunt has given an interview with the Daily Mail. Okay. No. Did you I yes. Oh my gosh. No, no. Oh my gosh. Also, I love it. I want an Aunt Debbie. 
So Maddie Healy's aunt implies Taylor Swift's The Tortured Poets Department tracks don't tell the full story about the romance. We know, quote, more about what went on. (laughs) (laughs) One of Maddie Healy's relatives has come to his defense. As fans speculated that several of Taylor Swift's songs from a brand new album reference their brief romance, including a song titled The Smallest Man, his aunt Debbie argued that there's much more to the picture than what Swift shared. Nothing surprises him anymore, she told the Daily Mail. He will not he will not be surprised by this song. Him and her know what went on. Oh my gosh. <laughs> How much do you think she was paid for that quote? <laughs> I'm sorry. That is just the the thing I love about that is like you just know in the way that Meghan Markle was like, I'm never speaking to my father again for talking to the tabloids. Matt and he was like, Thanks, Aunt Debbie. That was sick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're a real one. Exactly. Only they I'm know sure what Taylor went on. deleted her number from her phone. Oh, wait, she didn't. It was never there. <laughs> uh, we we know what went on. It's just the best part about it too is it's almost like so apathetic. Like, come on, girl. We know right. what happened. Yeah. We all know. Oh my gosh. Anyway, there's Ooh. truly so much to get into with this album. I really feel like we've scratched the surface. Um, I want to thank you both for being here today with us. Chandler, we are going to soldier on and do a part two um, sometime I mean, this week for people. Someone has to talk about Cassandra. Oh, someone's got to get <laughs> someone's got to get into so long, London. All right. And to finish off, let's just rapid fire. One to ten. Where do we rate this album? Seven for me. Okay. This one is a 7.75 for me. Wow. Okay. And can can I please hear what is a 10 for you from Taylor? Uh, a 10 is like Folklore 1989. But what I'll say is like this is in the bottom three of Taylor's albums for me. Wow. But it's not the bottom two. I actually don't think I could live with it. I, would, I don't want to live in a world without this album because of the yes. title track. Yes. But I could live in a world without um, Speak Now and without <gasps> uh, Self-Titled. Wait, you could live know. in a world without long live and last kiss? Should we even, should we even publish this episode? I think Joe is... I would, and in fact, I have for about <laughs> 10 years of my life. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not sure if you'll be back to talk wow. about Taylor after that okay. revelation. Well, Lauren, you just secured another year as my co-host. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> That was so earth shattering. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to shoulder on shoulder on like Taylor at the Aeros Tour. Before I get February. kicked off, my Strava username is <laughs> put plug for me. Wait, Chandler. Okay, so what is a ten for you? Um, I think 1989 is a ten for me. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, this album is a six point six point five for me. It's a six point okay. five. A ten for me is Midnight's. A ten for me is Snow on the Beach specifically. <laughs> It's like such oh, a I, actually Midnight's is below this album for me. <gasps> what? You know, a lot of people don't yeah. like Midnight's, and that's where I just know that I'm just See, alone in my genius sometimes. I, th- I want to one last thing. Midnight's to me is such a 10 because there's so many dance bops in it. Yes. There's so many dance bops, and this album doesn't really have any dance bops in it. it. Doesn't Maybe ha- besides, uh, you know, so I high can school. Do it with a broken heart. Or yeah, oh, I can yeah. do it with a broken heart, which, like we said, you know, I'm not going to be reaching for it. I agree that Midnight's has some dance bops. Like I, as much as anyone, like will listen to Bejeweled as I'm getting ready to go pick up my DoorDash from outside. But like, <laughs> 1989 has just better dance bops. Sure. You know, so yeah. I, I just don't need I mean, it. Yeah. Yeah. Ni- well, I need it for sure. Definitely. And need 1989 it. Dan- Vault Tracks is a 10 out of 10 for me. Anyway, you guys, thank you so much for listening. We could, we'll just, we need to stop talking and force ourselves because we will talk about Taylor forever. Joe, mm-hmm. where can people find you? I know they want more. Yes. So I am a big runner athlete. You can find me Joe Peacock on Strava. It's a social <laughs> network for athletes. You can find me at that Joe Peacock on my gated Instagram um, and Joe Peacock on LinkedIn. Perfect. We love you, okay. Joe. We love you, Joe. We love you, Taylor. And we sit at your feet. Okay. If I saw Taylor in person, I would throw my eyes up. Okay. The light, I wouldn't be able to see through the light. I would kneel and, t- and kiss her garment still to this day after this album. I just want to make that very clear. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. Bye. Okay. Love you both. Thanks Love for you. having me. Take a moment. Promise me this. That you'll stand by me forever. But if God forbid, fate should step in. And force us into a goodbye. If you have children someday. to the pictures Please tell them by name Tell them how the crowds went wild Tell them how I hope they shine Long live the walls we crashed through I had the 
for now folks don't forget give us a five-star review hit us up on instagram at pop apologists and we will see you next week live every wednesday Bye.